Hello and welcome to Math Interventions. This is Sonia Simons and Gina Onisar. Today we're going to talk to you about some Tier 1 interventions that you can utilize for math, cover, copy, and compare, incremental rehearsal, mnemonic devices for problem solving, and math apps. To start with, I just want to remind you that interventions don't have to be time consuming. There are some easy ways to make your everyday instruction more effective that can benefit all students. Um, you probably already know these. It's just kind of a reminder to maybe add them in a little bit more um, than you are. Anytime you can make your instruction more explicit or more like direct instruction would be great. Make sure that you teach the vocabulary and the symbols, even if it's not necessarily in your lesson plan or in your textbook to do that. Um, anytime you can use more of a graphic organizer model instead of extensive note taking that can help students use your concrete representational and abstract model so start with your manipulatives and then use a picture representation and then take that away to the abstract um, fluency building is really important students that don't know their basic facts um, are at an increased risk of having um, well, struggle with math at a higher level and then use a que effective questioning and feedback and also give your students corrective feedback or show them where they're making errors um, as soon as you can instead of waiting till after they do a bunch of homework assignments incorrectly like practicing the skill incorrectly the first one cover copy and compare is an approach to building fluency with basic facts and computation steps a student looks at a solved mathematics problem, covers it up, copies it, and solves it, and then compares it to see if the newly written problem matches the original problem. It only takes a few minutes to complete, and the student can use the practice every day. You'll need uh, training sheets of 10 math problems with problems and answers listed down the left side of the paper, one per student, one to three sets per session. You'll need assessment sheets with the same math problems listed down the left side without answers and index cards, one per student. This can be done daily or several times a week. Provide students with sets of training sheets and have them follow the cover, copy, and compare procedure. Once or twice a week, you'll want to administer assessment sheets that correspond to the training sheets, and if desired, you can time these assessment sessions. Once a student has reached 90% accuracy or better on your assessments, that would mean that they had mastered the skill. Um, or if you do a timed task, if they can do 40 digits per minute, that would also mean that they'd reached mastery. Okay, now we'd like to share a video with you that shows an example of the process. Hi, my name is Mindy, and this is Angela. Today we're going to be demonstrating how to use the academic intervention Cover, Copy, and Compare. This intervention is used to assist students with self-checking their work immediately after they complete it. So what we're going to do is I'm going to have you look at this math problem and study this and see how they got the answer. Now I'm going to cover it up and I'm going to ask you to do the problem without looking at the answer. It was 14 plus 14. Why don't you compare it to the one up here? Is that the same answer? Okay. Do you know how to fix it? Okay, good job. And here's the next one. Go ahead and study this answer. See how they came up with it. Okay. And now I'm going to cover that part up and I want you to answer the question. 15 plus 15. So this one, is that the same? Okay, good job. Now take a look at this problem and the answer. I'm going to cover that part up and I want you to try and figure out the answer to 20 plus 20.
move on to the next one. Study the top part. Seventeen. Plus seventeen. Okay, now I'm going to cover that up and try and figure out the problem. Seventeen plus seventeen. Good job. All right, last one. Study this problem and answer. Now I'm going to cover it up and try and figure out 30 plus 30. Okay, Gina, what would you suggest if um, I have a student who is simply copying the correct answer from the model and putting it on their answer blank, basically trying to pass it off as their own work? Well, an important part of cover copy and compare is for the student to actually independently solve the problem. So if you suggest that they are doing that, um, you might need to use a peer tutor um, or you know have the students partner up and take turns because you know they'll tell on each other. Um, or you might have to have like a, a high school student or, or I don't know, an older um, student come in and help or a parent or an adult, somebody to sit with them if you think there's something wrong. What if I have someone who's so disorganized that they lose the index card or et cetera before they can complete the worksheet? Mm -hmm. There's lots of different ways to do it. Um, like you saw in the video, she used a separate piece of paper for every problem. Um, you don't need to do that. You really don't even have to use the index card. You can put the problems on one side of the paper and have the student fold the paper in half. Um, so then when they flip the paper over, they can work the problem and then open it up to compare. So you could do it with just one piece of paper. Is this just for one student at a time, or could it be used in a class? Um, you could do it class-wide. You could give each student um, a paper, and they wouldn't have to be the same problems if you have students that need to work on different skills um, and just set a timer or whatever for them to do it for that day. Okay. Can I use this in other subjects? Yeah. Um, even in math, it wouldn't have to be with basic facts. Like the picture showed, you can do it with long division where they can see each step um, so that when they compare, they could see exactly what, you know, which step that they were making errors on. Um, you could do it with algebra problems too to show each step of how to solve a problem. And then you might not want 10 problems per page. You can modify that however it works best for, for whatever skill you're working on. Um, spelling can just simply be having the word on one side, and they have to copy it and compare. I mean, that's how simple it can be. Um, vocabulary, you could have them copy the word and definition, or you could have um, the word on the right side, and they have to copy the, you know, they have to remember the definition, or you could have the definition written, and you want them to come up with the actual vocabulary word. Um, geography, you can have them identify different regions on the map, on a map um, where they look at it and then have to do it on their own. Um, science, kind of the same idea with the periodic table. Or um, if you have um, steps of like the water cycle or different things like that that you want your students to memorize, you can use cover copy compare in that way. Okay. Another one would be incremental rehearsal. This is where a student is presented with flashcards containing unknown items and added into a group of known items. The student should be presented with material on a 90% known to 10% unknown ratio. This also increases fluency and it assumes that the child has acquired the skills needed to uh, quickly move through the process once they've learned their facts. And what research is saying is that presenting information that the student already knows with something that they don't know 
um, provides them with lots of opportunities for success because they, they have that confidence that I know most of these already. And it can just um, help some of those students that are reluctant to work on math if they, they might work on, on one that they don't know because they're getting you know nine correct. Um, but it, yeah, it just kind of helps with that momentum as well. So to do this one, you'll need flashcards, paper and pencil. You'll need to do a pre-test and a post-test and graph for data collection. Administer this daily, providing three unknowns. Weekly do a pre-test and a post-test, and it can take as little as five minutes per day, depending on the student's motivation and skills. Again, we're going to bring an example here. We had to do this one, so you can laugh at us in the privacy of your home. And not to laugh at us. Demonstrate for the rehearsal for you. First, you're going to want to gather any flashcards or whatever you want your student to learn um, and pre test so you know which facts they know and which facts they do not. 14. Don't know it in three seconds, you kind of add in the middle. Zero. Twelve. Zero. Eight. Thirty. Pretty sure. Yeah. Forty five. Forty. Five. Six, fifteen, twenty. I know you couldn't see, but what I did is I separated them in, into ones that she knew correctly in three seconds. So anyway, and then ones that she didn't know. So no ones and unknowns. So So then you're going to take your first unknown, and you want to pick nine knowns to make a stack of ten. For demonstration purposes, I'm going to just pick five notes so it goes a little bit faster. So then you put your unknown at the beginning of the stack and then you present that to the student. My turn. Three times two is six. Your turn. Three times two is six. Again. Three times two is six. Three times two is six. I'm going to present the unknown to you. Six. And one known. Fourteen. Go back. Unknown. Six. Known. Fourteen. Known. Eighteen. No, you wouldn't say unknown, known, known. You would say understanding for demonstration purposes. Back to your unknown. Six. Fourteen. Eighteen. Twenty-five. Six, fourteen, eighteen, twenty-five, ten, zero. Then you're going to take a known off of the back of your stack and put a second unknown. We're going to now assume that our first unknown is known since we practiced it lots of times. Eight times five is forty. Your turn. Eight times five is forty. Eight times five is forty. Eight times five is forty. Forty. Six. Forty. Six. Fourteen. Forty. Six. Fourteen. Eighteen. Forty. Six, fourteen, eighteen, twenty-five, forty, six. 
six, 14, 18, 25, 10. And again, you're going to take one off the back and introduce a new unknown. Five times seven is 35. 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 35. 40. 35. 40. 6. 35. 40. 6. 14. 35. 40. 6. 14. 18. 35. 40. 6, 14, 18, 25. At any point, if they struggle with the unknown more than just at the beginning, you would say, my turn, and say the problem, and then have them do the correction procedure again, where they say the problem three times. If they happen to do that on a known, if they get one wrong, you would do the same thing. So one thing that I would do differently um, from what I did in the video is you probably would want to take a known off of the front of the stack instead of the back because it would have been practiced more times. Mm -hmm. What if the student cannot get through the pile or it takes them longer than three seconds to answer every card? Well, you might need to choose a different intervention because this is for building fluency. Um, so if they don't know enough facts that quickly, then that might mean that you need to go back to an acquisition um, stage or an acquisition intervention where they need to learn the skill first. Um, you also will uh, encounter that student that just is a slow processor and may never be able to answer any math problem in less than three seconds. And you'll know that for that specific student, you might need to just give them more time. Um, you you can, might notice that on the pretest too, right? yeah. even with their known. Mm -hmm. Like they know how to do it. It's just they are just, you know, going to be a slower student. You might need to give them five seconds or whatever is appropriate for them. What if they're a student who's inattentive and they just don't seem to be focused? Well, you might need to add some kind of incentive like beating the clock if you set a timer, you know, and they need to get through the pile in a certain amount of time to kind of keep them focused. Um, or if you have to add, you know, a prize or something to it, you can do that too. And how could I remember the steps, or what if I get it screwed up and only have one known or too many mm -hmm. unknowns? Yep, we'll be providing you with the step-by-step -step directions on paper that you can download. And there's a cheat sheet on there where it says unknown, known, 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 and unknown, unknown, yeah. So you can follow those steps. And even if I make a few errors while I'm yeah. learning the process? Any fact practice with um, corrective feedback is better than nothing, so... Like, even on our video, I didn't do it exactly correct, and I think she still would have learned some stuff. So, How else could it be used in other subjects? Um, you can use it with sight word, vocabulary words, um, simple math facts like we showed. If you want to, like at the kindergarten or preschool level, if you want to do letter names, letter sounds, um, spelling words, you could have them read, spell, read, show them it, and then take it away. Um, even like signs, survival signs like stop signs or... Um, pedestrian signs and things like that for lower functioning students you can use it that way too um, really state yeah anything state capitals meanings and prefixes and suffixes just you can kind of use your imagination whatever however you could use it mnemonic devices for problem solving the purpose of a word problem mnemonic is to provide students with a framework for solving word problems the mnemonic reminds students to work step-by-step step through the word problem, and depending on the mnemonic device, the strategy can be used for acquisition, fluency, and or generalization. You'll need the materials of having the visual image of the mnemonic, example models for the students, and practice problems for the students to utilize it with. Uh, teachers should select one mnemonic device that can be generalized and used across word problems so that it can be used all year. The teachers must provide explicit instruction on the mnemonic along with multiple opportunities to practice. And here are a couple 
um, different mnemonics for solving algebra problems or quadratic or whatever they're called. Um, but one of them was to make a man with a big nose. And so that just means that for the eyebrows, you're going to multiply the x times x and then negative 3 times 5. And then for the nose, you'd have negative 3 times x. And for the mouth, you would have x times 5. Or um, a way that I was taught to do it was called FOIL, where you do the first terms, the outer terms, the inner terms. So just kind of an, of an example, it doesn't matter necessarily which mnemonic you use, just as long as you're consistent with it for your students. But you had a video for that one too, right? Um, yeah, we have one for a word problem. Um, I believe she calls it Buck. There is a little ad here at the beginning, so you'll have to be a little bit patient till we can get through that. Welcome to Master Middle School Math. This video can be used as a model for teachers to teach their own students. It can also be used by students to learn math, and it can also be used by parents as a model to help their own children. Today we will learn how to solve word problems. Word problems are the way that you can use your mathematical skills to apply them to real life situations. After all, life is a word problem. When you're all grown up and you have a boss, they're not going to come out to you and give you a worksheet with a math problem. They're going to say, move all of this product to such and such place in such and such days, and how much will that cost me, and how, what's the best way to do it? So you're going to have to figure out how to do that using your math skills. You'll have to decide what operation you're going to use and how you're going to work out that problem, what information is relevant. Many students get really scared of word problems because they just think there's too much information and they get a little mixed up. So I have an easy way to remember how to break it down and make it easy to solve. So we are going to use the acronym of a BUCK, B-U-C-K, to remember how to break down a word problem. And I think BUCK is easy to remember because after all, we all remember money. So use a BUCK to solve word problems. B. Box the question. U. Underline the information needed to solve the problem. C. Circle the vocabulary that you'll need to know in order to answer the question. And K. Knock out the unneeded information. Many people get confused because they look at information that's not relevant to the question. So the first step is to read your question. At a shop on Times Square, three I Love New York t-shirts sell every 10 minutes for $19.95 each. Every 45 minutes, one Yankees hat sells for $24.95. Shop is open from 9 a.m. until 9 p.m. every day. How many t-shirts are sold in a week? Some students might go, eek, eek, I cannot do this problem. There are too many words, too many numbers. Oh, what am I going to do? Oh, take a deep breath. Yes. You can solve this problem because you are going to use the BUCK system to SOS, simplify, organize, and solve the problem. You're going to break this problem down and make it easier for you to do. Okay, so here's our problem. We're going to use the BUCK system, so we're going to box our question. Then we need to underline the information we need in order to answer this question. So three t-shirts are sold every 10 minutes, and the store is open from 9 to 9 every day. Now we need to circle the vocabulary of the words that we need to understand in order to solve this problem, right? So minutes, we need to know what a minute is and how many there are. Every day, what does that mean when we say it's open 9 to 9 every day and a week? The information that we can knock out of there so that we don't get confused, is $19.95 each, so just knock that out of the picture. You don't need to know that because they're not asking about uh, cost, just about how many. And the Yankees hats, all the information about the Yankee hats, you can just knock out of there because they're not asking us about Yankee hats. They're just talking about t-shirts. So here's the information needed to solve our problem. There are 60 minutes in an hour, and there are 12 hours from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m., so we're going to multiply 12 times 60. That's going to give us 720 total minutes per day that the shop is open. A t-shirt sells every 10 minutes, so we're going to divide our total minutes by 10. So 720 divided by 10 equals 72 per day. Are we finished? Well, no. The question said how many per week. So we need to know that there's seven days in a week. 
72 t-shirts per day times seven days gives us 504 t-shirts. The answer to the question is the shop sells 504 t-shirts per week. You're finished. Good job. So here's another problem, and this is an example. As you can see, that's kind of a lengthy video. So maybe later when you have time, you want to watch the rest of it if you need further explanation. But um, it can be located on YouTube. What, what would I do, Gina, if the mnemonic device doesn't seem to work for every word problem that the student encounters? And it won't. Um, it's just like when you teach grammar rules, your rule doesn't fit every single instance. Um, you're also still going to need to just teach good problem solving strategies so your students could use those if the mnemonic isn't going to work. Um, we're also going to provide a reference that is called or has to do with using cognitive and metacognitive strategies for solving story problems and if you use those steps with your students too they should have the skills that they need for for those word problems. Okay. Are students allowed to use mnemonic devices for state testing? Well, we would hope that they would if that's what you have taught them. Um, you shouldn't, you know, walk around saying, use Buck, use Buck, <laughs> um, when they come across a story problem. But if the students are using it on their own, then you know that they've generalized the skill and then you should celebrate somehow because mm -hmm. it's worked. And certainly when you're teaching the skill, you can say, you know, this is something you can use mm -hmm. on testing. You can yeah. use it whenever you run into a problem. Mm -hmm. How else could mnemonic devices be used in other content? Um, you probably have used a lot. You know, you can when you put things to music, like the ABC song. Um, we've used names like Roy G. Biv for the um, colors. Um, Please excuse me, Jerry and Sally is what we use to remember order of operations. Um, any type of model, flowcharts, graphs, etc., rhymes like the 30 days of September for June and November. Um, and then your notes can be if you put them in an outline or anything like that. It's we use mnemonics all the time. We don't think about it. We wanted to find a math app that could be beneficial for our older students. So I made a clip here to demonstrate one that we located. I found that is free to download. and has some different options for your fifth grade, sixth grade algebra students. Your math teacher, when you go into it, you can select from elementary, middle school, and high school, or community college, etc. Fifth grade, sixth grade, pre-algebra, algebra one, geometry, and algebra two. If we look at algebra one, say the student is having difficulty with equations, maybe multi-step equations, you can select from that. And then the app is going to provide you some problems with example clips that will explain to the student how to work through the problem. To solve for x in this equation, our first step is to simplify the left side by distributing this 3 through both terms inside the parentheses. When we do that, when you go back out, the app also on the bottom has options to take some practice problems where it'll give the student a hint, provide them an answer, show them the work, how to work through the problem. They can challenge themselves with some different problems, as well as take a self-test to kind of review the problems and see how they're doing. Like I said, there's several categories within here that could be chosen or that your student could maybe work independently to get some answers when you're not available. Another level of instruction maybe when you're not sure the best method, method to teach it, but just another option that's available. And there's also several math apps for practicing um, math facts. Um, I'm sure a lot of you have looked at those or download them. You can just do a search and you'll come up with, with several options have have students practice their fluency independently. 
Gina was also discussing some of the uh, templates and examples that we had to help you remember the steps and procedures. You can download simply if you want to know how to do, do a cover copy compare. You would go to the cover copy compare and highlight that, click on it. Once you click on it, it should allow you to darken the download. You'll download and then you'll click that and it should come up as, as any other file. You'll have to know where to locate it, but just the same as if you would download from an email wherever those files go. So you can print these all off or print them as needed if you just want to have the steps for one of the procedures. And then we just provided you some of the resources that we had used and where you can provide some interventions for you as well. Gina, did you have any other information? No, just um, so that you know that inter inter uh, evidence-based intervention network site um, also provides videos for their interventions. Um, we're not as impressed right now with the math part of that network because math hasn't been researched as much as reading has. So there's lots of information for, for reading and some for behavior too. But it is a place to look and they'll have step-by-step -step directions for the interventions on that website too. And it's nice because it's um, split up into like acquisition and fluency and, and those different oh, areas. So mm -hmm. you can look under a specific skill you're trying to yes, work on. Yeah, and um, Intervention Central has some map ones too. So just some places that you can look. Thank you. Um, I hope this was helpful. If you have any questions, please contact us. Our emails are on the ESU8 website. Thank you.